Welcome back, everyone, to the Disaster Tough Podcast, where we share insights into the big plays and right calls of leadership. We dive deep into the stories, lessons learned, and ideas that will help you in the field. Let's go. Welcome back to the Disaster Tough Podcast. I'm your host, John Scardina. I'm so excited for this week's episode with Michelle Chikowski. I practice her name every morning in the mirror. She's one of my best friends. She's a great leader, and she's an emergency manager down there in Florida. On top of everything else she does, besides running her program, which we're going to be talking about today, she's also with Florida Task Force 4, which she got an award for their team member for last year. So huge shout out to her for that and to Florida Task Force 4, the USAR team. And on top of that, she's also kind of the secret sauce behind the Florida Hazmat Symposium. I was lucky enough to be the keynote speaker for the 11th year of that symposium. They'll do it again next year, so make sure you go again. It's a huge production. So she runs so many different things simultaneously, truly an emergency manager through and through. But she has all these kinds of cool experiences and backgrounds. You might recognize her name and face from a year ago when I had the opportunity to interview her. So I wanted to bring her on the show just to talk to her and I, catch up all the good things. Let me bring Michelle onto the stage. Welcome, Michelle. How are you doing? Hello. How are you? Oh my gosh, I'm good. Let's talk about, you got the USAR thing, you got the Florida Hazmat thing, you got your uh, full-time job thing, you got uh, adjunct professor thing. You're a, an awesome mom. You're an emergency momager. There's so many different areas of which you're incredibly influential. Let's start with what you want to talk about. And all those different areas, uh, maybe full-time job or Florida Hazmat Symposium, what, is, what are you focusing on right now? Um, well, first of all, I don't sleep. so And I figured out the secret to 40-hour days. So there's that. But yeah. Yeah. I was... I, I worked until three or four in the morning. So if you can teach me longer days, I would love it. Heck no. My kids tuck me in these days. So they're teenagers. They have to tuck mama in now. That's hilarious. So but you yeah. do a lot of things. How do you even, before you can get into like each of the different key areas, how do you actually manage all those things? How do you prioritize your needs? Because emergency managers, oh my gosh, every time I talk to everybody, they have everything feels urgent, everything feels important. And they're we're kind of really bad at actually prioritizing what's most important for that moment. How do you deal with that? Um, I make lots of sticky note lists. I love my sticky notes. I'm going to have to buy more soon. Um, you know, I can, I'm lucky to have a wonderful staff. You mentioned Sai. So I can delegate and she is amazing. And uh, she always makes the joke that our two brains together are one brain. So, um, you know, all I have to do is bring up something and she can finish my sentences. So it's awesome. Yeah, your entire staff, um, you know, the three of you over there just rocking it. And um, it's it really is something special to to meet the three of you. And finally got to meet McKenna. Yes. Oh, so happy I got that right. Don't you take her. Uh, yeah. Well, honestly, I mean, as an urban planner, she has such a unique um, kind of perspective on emergency management that sometimes I wish that we were ingrained more into that urban planning perspective. But really, for sure, that job is more hazmat, of course. But using these different things, you and Cy are definitely, I don't know how that works. But uh, honestly, backing up between you and Jonathan... And then you and Cy and you and McKenna, like, you know, and there's probably other people in your world. You're able to match different personality types and connect very fast. So again, prioritization, I, I understand you're being humble, but really you, you're able to be a chameleon in so many different positive ways. How do you learn that skill set? Because we, we desperately need those skill sets in our field. I mean, I don't know if it's learned per se. I've just always been like that. I'm, I've am i always been a sponge and um, I continually, even now, you know, continually go to school and working on a little FEMA infrastructure, emergency management infrastructure certificate series. So um, yeah. And I don't know. I just, I, I guess just a sponge and um, I'm always, 
uh, somebody calls me the Energizer Bunny. Keep going and going and going. Yeah, pretty much. The L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio solves problems and is specifically designed for emergency services. How do we know? We field tested it with medical, urban search and rescue, and collapsed and confined structures. This radio is amazingly tough. Check out the L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio at L3Harris.com right now. If you served in the military, you've probably worn Proper Apparel. Proper Apparel is now reaching out to first responders and those who love the outdoors. Check out Proper Apparel from the outdoors to the EOC, wear proper. How do you spell Doberman Emergency Management? EOP, OEP, HVA, HMP, Thyra, TTX, Drone, PDA. Whenever you need an expert, Doberman Emergency Management field experts are there for support. Contact an expert at DobermanEMG.com today. I'm kind of the same way in the fact that like, I like bouncing to different things. Mm-hmm. Steve Johnson was on our podcast. He's um, head of counter Seaburn for the British Army. He's a police officer. He's an adjunct professor. He does a bunch of different things as well. He described it for himself as um, wanting a new challenge so he wouldn't get bored. Exactly. Is that the same thing? That's what I mean by, yeah, I'm a sponge and I'm always looking at a new class to take, a certification, a new project. I'm always looking at grants to apply for, you know, what's the criteria for this type of federal grant and how can we make a project out of that that will benefit the first responders and emergency management offices in my region? Yeah, I mean, quite frankly, that, um, man, I, I wish... We can, we need to sit down later and figure out that how to take that secret sauce that you have, extract it, put into <laughs> other people. Um, the people I love hiring um, are those kind of people. They're mm-hmm. able to just, they have such a, especially like Zach, um, and just like this thirst of knowledge, just yes. can't get enough of it. And it's not like a anxious thing. It's just curiosity and just wanting to keep exploring. Right. However, there's, there's a difference of people like that and uh, I call it the addiction of entrepreneurship, where people sometimes who are entrepreneurs have more ideas in the morning shower than most people do in a lifetime. But the people who are unsuccessful keep jumping to new ideas without maturing the other good ideas they have. Exactly. How do you balance that? Give yourself time to mature one idea while still obtaining new skill sets. I mean, you, you have to know when to say no. And that might come from experience, um, come from starting a new project before you ended the other one and the other one not being so successful at all. Um, So I think it just comes from that experience and knowing when to say no to other people and to yourself. If you're learning how to say no and learning to, uh, there's another skill set of learning to say yes, Mm -hmm. being excited for things. Let's, uh, if you're, if you're willing, I would like to break down each of your different sectors of your jobs because they're so drastically different in the needs and scopes. It's, uh, I'm sure there's some similarities, but they are totally different. I'm hyper, uh, curious about the Florida hazmat symposium. Okay. That is such a beast to put on. I was so impressed. Um, you have hundreds of people coming. I think my count was six or 700 people when I was there. It's growing every year. You're maximizing your spaces. You have uh, people all over the country coming. You have tons of presentations. You have a competition that's happening. You had an incredible uh, keynote speaker last time. Oh, yes. Just the best. Um, it, you just have all these moving parts, right? From an organizational standpoint of putting on such like a big event like that, uh, where's your where's the most of your focus uh, going to? Where are some of the headaches and how do you avoid mm-hmm. the chaos that can implode if you if it's not put on well? Because it seems very seamless by the time everybody gets there. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, all these grays, I cover them with blonde highlights, but um, but yeah, I mean, I I appreciate that you says that it looks seamless but um so the hazmat symposium like you pointed out we just finished our 11th year january 2024 was our 11th year in a row um i was not there at the beginning so it kind of fell into my lap um from my current full-time job so it was a conference that's put on in our region as the 
director of emergency preparedness, which I wasn't nine years ago when I started, but it kind of became my project to do. So I met Jonathan Lamb. I met uh, some other people from around the state who are doing it, but they were doing it under the umbrella of a statewide organization and they were paying them money and in turn they were giving them a couple classrooms and some hotel rooms to put on some hazmat classes so my first year i just pretty much did what everybody said i had no clue what what it even entailed i want to say there was probably around 100 people who were there for our part for a couple hazmat classes over a couple days and um i want to say it was five classes and we had five instructors So um, Jonathan and I were talking and he explained to me, you know, how it was his baby, his idea. He presented it to the state to better spend our statewide hazmat training money since each uh, regional planning council was spending the same money or their allotted money on the same classes year after year. Why not do this annual conference, bring everybody together and, you know, share the pot of money and the money goes further. So for the same training. And I was like, yeah, but you're giving all of your registration money to this other organization. And I'm like, I think we can do this better. So um, he trusted me, asked him for a social security number and seriously. And he and I incorporated Wow. The Florida Hazardous Materials Symposium used my social, his social, and, you know, our personal money. And um, within a year, we became a nonprofit organization through the IRS. And um, then we started going to all of the other hazmat conferences, not to, you know, take anything away from them by any means, but we knew that there was other ideas, other instructors, other issues that we are having in Florida were going on in other parts of the country. So making those connections and not just for the classes and instructors who are the elite of the elite, but I talked to the people behind the scenes. How are you doing this? How are you handling hotel rooms? How are you handling your schedule and creating your schedule and picking your instructors and staying up to date on the current trends. And so we did that and it just continued to grow from there. Yeah. The, um, gosh, when you're talking about Jonathan, I have such a, um, gosh, what what is is your word? A crush, a man Man crush. Yes. I really do. I know you do. Most charismatic (laughs) leaders I have met and he's truly a showman. Um, but what makes him special is, the passion. I have the opportunity, as you have, to go to a lot of different conferences, to meet organizations all over the globe at this point. And it's uh, it's sad when either the, the production quality might be there, but y- you realize that something's missing. You can't figure out what it is. And then you meet the organizers. Either they don't have a background or they're just not passionate about it anymore. Mm-hmm. 11 years into it, you and Jonathan, I mean, you're all in. You, you really believe in what you're talking about. And he gets emotional. You can oh, see yeah. it. I mean, the excitement and, and it, it makes other people excited. There's so mm-hmm. many different types of leadership that are required. There's organizational leadership, which is like all you. And you have like the showman who comes out of nowhere and just, you know, just like pumping energy into it. And so like the both of you are just hyping this whole thing up. And then all the support staff, Sai and McKenna and everybody else who's coming in, even your IT guys your entire group are actual practitioners who care mm-hmm. about what they're wanting to put on and it, it comes out like it, it really does show. And so uh, man crush is definitely the appropriate word there. Um, but you know, it, it's well-deserved honestly. So huge shout out to you and, and the team for that one, but thank you. Moving on from kind of the, the hazmat um, symposium perspective to the USAR team, I'm going to probably finish with your full-time job. Okay. That USAR thing is um, s- such a different beast, right? Instead of like events management planned out, you got a year to do all the things. USAR is e- exactly opposite, right? Yeah. It's go when you need it. And shout out to Walt Lewis and everybody else on Task Force 44 and you for getting the award from last year. 
what is the tempo change for you from the hazmat symposium to the I would say like the skill set needed to be in the USAR team, at least emotionally or, or dealing with that stress. Well, I mean, I'm a civilian and I have been a civilian for quite a long time, but I did start out way back in my previous life as a first responder. So hmm. um, I started out as a 911 dispatcher and within a year and a half of doing that, I went to the law enforcement academy and became a law enforcement officer. So um, you know, I did that for almost 10 years and that was where I got bit by the emergency management bug. Oh. Um, and again, it just happened to me. It's not like I sought it out, but oh. I had gotten married to another cop and, um, we had some babies, two babies under two years old. So I had, was coming back from my second maternity leave and wasn't quite ready to go back full duty. So I was in the office, special ops. Um, and the captain of special ops was like, Hey, I was thinking about starting this incident management team for the police department. And I know you like to do stuff and you're here 40 hours a week for a couple more weeks. You know, you want to help me do it. And I was like, sure. What's mm. incident management? Yeah. And he's like, you know, NIMS, ICS. I'm like, no clue what you're talking about. How many years so, ago was this? Just at a carry frame of reference. This was um, 99. 99. No, not 99. Um, no, 99 is when I graduated the academy. So when did I? Oh, 2000. Well, I had my son in 2007. So it was okay. 2007. Copy. Yep. Okay. So, so right around, it must have been like summer, just before summertime, huh. 2007. Um, he sent me to Anniston, Alabama, and that's when you took ICS 100 through 400 in one week mm. in Anniston, Alabama, and um, came back and then did that for a couple years. You know, it was a specialty team, mm. so I was back in patrol, but you were kind of on call and um, helped write the original policies for the incident management team. We were on call. We got called out normally for like SWAT and CNT, crisis negotiated. Yeah. negotiation team call outs, which were no notice. Hmm. But, you know, I would sit in the mobile command vehicle and listen to CNT do their thing and, you know, organize um, who was there and Man. when we were going to feed everybody and fill out all the ICS forms. And so I think it was the same captain. He's like, you know, you can go to school for this. And I was like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? This is for real? And, um, and so again, having two babies under two years old and married to a fellow cop, I was like, you know what, all I have is a law enforcement certificate and an AA degree at this point. Hmm. If I can make this a career, I'm in. So I resigned. I went back to school. I started in like my international humanitarian aid slash emergency management, the October 25th of 2006. Okay. And when I tell people like, oh, 2006, 2007 is when I really started getting into like this field. Mm -hmm. I keep thinking it was like three or four years ago. Right. I know. And it's like, oh, crap. That's like almost 20 years. Almost. Ago. Yeah. It's it, it it's like I can like feel like the light black hair coming out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's, it, it, that's why I say in my previous life, because it seems like it was a whole, which pretty much I mean. And but I'm only you know 29, so don't do the math. <laughs> yeah, you started when you were uh, you know four years old. Five. Exactly, exactly. But I didn't really answer your question. So um, to answer your question, you know, whatever you want to call first responders, adrenaline junkies, you know, we run towards the danger. I guess in a way, um, in my civilian slash old lady age, being a member of. Task Force 4 is my way to get my adrenaline going, you know, without being on the front lines. Because I'm certainly, those men and women are the heroes. I'm Task Force 4, mostly firefighters. And, you know, they're doing the swift water rescues and um, searching buildings and all of that. So, Were you at Surfside Building Collapse? I wasn't. Mm. Um, I was supposed to go and my uncle passed away that morning. Oh, so that. yeah, yeah, it was a huge family, an unexpected family thing, and I had to pull out at the last minute. The uh, 
I think Walt was talking about Surfside on the mm-hmm. podcast before, and he's brought up some of the other responses. You know, um, it's probably a good reminder, actually. I mean, I'm glad you shared that. I'm, I'm sorry that mm-hmm. it happened to your uncle, but a lot of people think that they have to sacrifice a family for their career. And uh, I think I think family's number one. If, if you can take for care sure. of your family, then you can focus on more on your career. And um, that's probably a good call out for that anyways. Um, there will always be more responses, unfortunately. And fortunately, exactly. Yeah. So, exactly. Yep. So you're, you're, oh my gosh, dispatch, by the way, uh, a huge shout out to everybody who's in dispatch. They are first responders. 100%. They are, they are they don't get enough heroes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you have dispatch. You have, by the way, you're like one of the nicest people I've ever met, but I would be really nervous if you got angry and you started yelling commands at me like a lot of force officers. So, uh, avoid yeah, that ask like my son about that later. Yeah. So dispatch, law enforcement, emergency management, USAR. Do you yes. have any plans to become a volunteer firefighter anytime soon? Yeah, heck no. I'm too old for that. No. It's like you, you're doing uh, the gambit here. Yeah. Uh, we get there, there's a lot of issues and i understand the cultural issues sure like everybody sticks to their like tribe whatever like law enforcement firefighters whatever but quite frankly we could be a lot more effective in response if we coordinated that better for and sure i love that so sure. like the reading slab has been trying to pull in all emergency services including emergency management and military saying hey we all have a piece of this pie so let's work together a little bit better mm-hmm from somebody who's been doing like so many different aspects of the job, uh, what hurdles do we need to overcome in order to be more effective as a field? Um, definitely the collaboration. I mean, it's just what you said. So when I first started in this job and I was exposed to the fire department and doing trainings and exercises with the firefighters and I had no fire background whatsoever, Uh, besides, you know, car wrecks when I was in patrol or whatever and let them do their thing. But um, the first time I was at a training exercise and I saw that district chief or battalion chief on the back of his car and he had all the little magnetic names and he was keeping track of who was where in the building. And I was like, oh, that's genius. Why don't cops do this? You know, because firefighters do incident command on pretty much every call in their sleep like nothing and as police officers we're taught to be autonomous you know save your own life and you know your nearest backup is several minutes away but um these days you know you might have a partner they always show on you know chicago pd everybody's partnered up in the car and driving around to Mm. the city together but, you know, for the most part, that doesn't happen, especially in routine patrol. You're yeah. by yourself. And, you know, active shooter comes out in the middle of the day at a business or a school. You're the first one there. And again, you know, you're going to wait for the rest of the people to show up. Absolutely not. Yeah. You're in it by yourself. But, you know, how do you how do you change that in law enforcement when when that's how they're taught and that's the nature of the business whereas the fire truck pulls up and of course there's three or four of them already together on the truck you know do you think the the camaraderie in fire service is closer because they all live together in the firehouse and they're more together like i I see these uh, the police officers and they don't seem to skip a beat at all but they are mostly by themselves most of the time they are um emergency managers I would say are even worse off. Like you might have one person as duties as assigned and your next closest emergency manager is a County away. Yeah. Um, I do. I, I'm going to pin that thought because I want to go back real quick before I forget. Okay. Part of the, part of the reason I think that, uh, the collaboration coordination doesn't really happen is because their jobs are so tactical Mm -hmm. that they're not, they're not really prepared for anything large scale. Right. Like they're taught, you know, the 90 percent of the calls are going to be, you know, one truck, one car guy showing up. Somebody's freaking out. Turns out to not to be not it's not life saving. It's, you know, so like how do they even get the skill set to go from 90 percent of the time I'm going to be pulling somebody over or dealing with this car scene 
going to large scale stuff. And, and we talked about training, but even if you have an annual training, I mean, is should we change our expectations of what first responders can do in a large scale incident because of that? Cause it's so rare for them. Um, no, I mean, maybe so my thought and you know, I mean, I've spent many hours trying to solve this problem and, you know, change the world with, with my brilliant solution. But I mean, the only thing that I could really come up with is, you know, you have all the cops responding to whatever the disaster is, the emergency at that time, but you still need that resource management, the, um, the resource tracking part of it that comes with the incident command that the fire department does so well, but you also want as many men and women with guns to, you know, take out the bad guy. If if that's what the situation is too, you don't want, you know, five of them hanging back to fill out paperwork. So, you know, where's the happy median? And I just think it's more of teaching the higher leadership that, you know, because they're the ones who are, um, they're still responding to the calls. And of course, you know, different sheriff's office and police departments around the nation um, handle their, their calls and, um, and their responses differently. But, you know, from the street sergeant, maybe to the street lieutenant, um, watch commander, whatever they're called, um, they have some places have corporals, you know, but higher in the leadership, if there's enough of them, then as long as there's enough people responding with the guns, then you could still have that incident management hanging back, you know, similar to the fire department. It's mm-hmm. just known that, um, you know, everyone on the truck is going in, responding, doing whatever they do. But you have that battalion chief or that district chief that is, or the captain, you know, whatever the rank is, showing up in their separate vehicle. And mm-hmm. they, everybody knows that they're probably not going in. They're hanging back and, and keeping track. I've, I've had, had this, this uh, long standing conversation with people on the show, uh, off the show, the whole deal. Do you think emergency managers should be in charge of first responders as a whole? I don't know. I don't think emergency managers should be in charge because that's not what emergency managers do. Emergency managers should manage the people and the resources. That's Mm -hmm. what they do. So if it's an active shooter, then it's a law enforcement issue. If it's a huge structure fire, it's a fire department issue. So emergency manager could come out there to help that fire chief or that police chief or um, person in charge manage their resources, mm. but don't tell them what to do. They know their jobs. So I, I'm just thinking from an organizational perspective from mm-hmm. different industries. I can't think of another industry, and I really have put a lot of work into this, of uh, where the strategic level um, is under the tactical level. Mm-hmm. I understand from an administration standpoint, the people who are running in, they don't need somebody from outside to be telling them what to do. However, in an active shooter, you have the guys trying to stop the bad guy, but then you have the paramedics trying to do life saving. Right. Mm-hmm. Then you could potentially have uh, you know, reunification at the school. You're dealing with the administrators. Mm-hmm. You're dealing with... Um, um now recovery with psychological first aid and managing all those resources now we're getting into grants and doing all these different things and so from an organizational standpoint of like government like the political appointee Mm -hmm. in my mind when i go into a a community and the emergency manager is answering to the fire like the fire chief or the police chief Mm -hmm. um what ends up happening is that they naturally naturally lean into fire or police and they lose that strategic coordination piece. That's, that's where I'm like, how do we, how do we make sure that our profession stays relevant? Because once you're, you're moving into one of those areas, I, I don't think any police officer in the country wants a firefighter to write their tactical plans. Vice versa. You don't want, a police officer to talk about, you know, 
what firefighters or paramedics should do mm -hmm. from the coordination piece. I feel like unless we remove the silo and say, this is one beast under one thing, whatever that thing is, you're going to keep getting silos. That's where I, I start getting, Oh, yeah. what should we do? Because That's quite frankly, I'm not, I should never tell a police officer or firefighter or paramedic how to do their job or what their job is. Right. But from the coordination standpoint, there has right. to be some kind of incident management. Right. And I think that's where a strong emergency manager or incident commander, um, and I'm using incident commander loosely, sure. um, but, you know, that's where the a strong person coming in and knowing the ins and outs of incident management, no matter what the incident is. I mean, when COVID started, we didn't know what the heck COVID was. We're not public health, mm. you know, employees anything sure. like that, but we could go in and run a COVID test site because you're managing the resources. So, uh, but you depend, right, right. You're And, um, but to answer your question, so, you know, you're talking about strategies and tactics, but it's those overarching objectives. So as the emergency manager, incident commander, whatever you want to call it, you know, I'm saying, okay, our objective is to rid myself of hunger. So yeah. you, as my sandwich maker, how are you going to rid my, rid me of hunger? Did you just tell me to make you a sandwich? I did, <laughs> you know. But this this is the analogy that I use to my students because, yeah. you know, young 20-something-year-olds, which not all of them are, but, you know, when, it, when they're just in the education part of emergency management, they don't understand objectives versus strategies versus tactics. And this is what I tell them. So your objective is to rid yourself of hunger. The strategy is I'm going to make myself a sandwich. Mm -hmm. All right. The tactic is two slices of bread, turkey, cheese, and mayonnaise. Mm. Right. And then you throw finance in there. Okay. Are you? And I know you're not from Florida, but we have public sports head down here, public subs. Oh man, those subs. I yes. got one of those subs last time. It was so uh -huh. good. Yeah. 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 But and so Arthur, then I throw yeah. <laughs> and then I so I throw in, you know, finance in there. Well then, you know, you got finance telling you, are you gonna order the Publix deli meat or the Boar's Head deli meat? They both do the same thing, but one's cheaper than the other one, right? Or more cost effective. So and that's how I explain it to my students. Okay. So I'm gonna use the restaurant analogy to beat this dead boar. Um okay, so if I have the relationship with government as the owner of the restaurant being the mayor or the governor, let's say mayor for the sake of a city, the chef therefore would be the emergency manager. The waiters would be the first responders. They go out to the public, they do it, but they also bring it back and say, this is what we need. Right. And the emergency manager has to get everything in order so that the waiter can go deliver the thing. Right. Um, so like even in a restaurant industry, the chef is still in charge of the waiters, even though the he's they're not getting involved with that that process. Right, they're not cooking the food, and the chef's probably not cooking the food. He probably has other people cooking the food, but he's ordering those food deliveries to be delivered. I need the this you know ten steaks delivered by six p.m. Exactly, and if the chef doesn't deliver, then the chef still gets screwed up because even though they're in charge, they're also dealing with a relationship where they need to take orders from the waiters as well. Okay. So we're beating this one. Uh, f let's talk about professionalization of the field. You've done everything. I have found when I go to USAR even, um, which can be a hodgepodge of firefighters and uh, paramedics, really. But you have those industries. You have, you, you've been in law enforcement. I've seen a lot of, like seen military the professionalization of that of those standards, even the uniforms, give them clout within the field, right? And respect against each other. They might not like each other all always, but they know they understand that they're a professional. Emergency managers are all over the place. Uh, we're working on it as a field. What would be your advice to help the field become more professional? Not like professional as you know what I mean by professional, like you're doing your best and you're, you have a good persona. I'm talking about like the, the actual field itself being professionalized. Right. Right. I mean, I think we're heading that way because, you know, 
And again, I'm in Florida, so we have six months of hurricane season. And then when we're not in hurricane season, then we're in severe weather season. So, you know, we can't win. But um, it's either hurricanes or tornadoes, severe weather, with a little bit of hail in there. So, um, and occasionally we'll get some cold weather, which I know you're going to laugh at. But um, Hey, it's drastic when it's in the South, when it happens, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is, it is. But, um, you know, so I don't I don't really have that exposure per se, besides what I see on the news or read on LinkedIn and stuff about um, how other states are dealing with it. But, you know, I have heard from other states how Florida is looked at by those other states as one of the best. Absolutely. And I, guess, I guess from the outside looking in we look like we have our crap together, especially when there's a hurricane barreling down on us. You know, yeah. if you ask us, we're like, eh, I don't know about that. But, um, but I mean, you know, when you keep doing the same thing over and over, you're eventually going to do something right. Right. <laughs> well, I've been in Florida for the tornado or for the, for the hurricanes, specifically hurricane Matthew was my first one there. And I've seen mass flooding incidents there. I've seen tornadoes there. I've seen all kinds of random stuff in Florida. And yeah, Florida does have their act together. I've been in other states where because of lack of frequency, they don't have it together. Um, and that's not taking away the, the from the professionalism of the individual. But, but uh, how do we as a field, you know, what's the solution? Uh, what is maybe one solution or a couple ideas where... Uh, if I'm in Florida, Georgia, public sector, private sector, where we can say, hey, if you're getting an emergency manager, this is like the thing you can expect. Should we have better branding? Should we have uniforms? Should we not? Should we like what's our persona as emergency managers even like? Yeah, I mean, I hopefully we don't have to dress up in monkey suits to be taken seriously. But um, I mean, I would do it if if I would wear a monkey suit. Well, I, know if, <laughs> I know you would. I know you would. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a blast. All the FEMA classes, obviously, FEMA is is the go to standardization for um, you know your incident command system. All of the independent study classes, which I think it's like hundreds of them now, depending on your interest and your field and the types of hazards and all of that. Um, but you know, we have the International Association of Emergency Managers, which has the AEM and CEM certifications but i mean it's recognized right yeah it's recognized so you know recognize it as something that's for sure yeah yeah so it's recognized um florida we have a florida certification and we have you know a mid-step and then the full certification depending on your years of experience and all of that so i mean i think each state has to find its own you know if we're talking about Washington or the Pacific Northwest, they have earthquakes, they don't have hurricanes. So, you know, what does that look like under their response and experience and qualifications? They have volcanoes. We don't have that. We don't even have mountains here, except for Space Mountain, Thunder Mountain. Thunder Mountain? How tall is Thunder Mountain? No, I have no idea. 50 feet? Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Well, either way, I mean, you're 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 giving like this encouragement of like, hey, we're we're moving in that direction. I just want to keep pushing that direction. I, I no, think, me too. You know, minimum standards is not a way to exclude people, but to help people get more sure. influence in their job, whatever that is. And honestly, uh, Michelle, from a person who has so many different, you know, notches on her belt for doing so many great things in so many different areas and finding success. You're just an interesting person to talk to and to learn from. And I'm sure your students at the university feel the exact same way, as well as your staff and myself included. So thank you so much for taking oh, the time to come thank on. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Of course. Okay, everybody. If you got something out of this podcast, which you should have because Michelle is incredible, we want you to give us a five-star rating and subscribe, of course, all that thing. But... Yeah, the big five. Uh, if you have questions for Michelle, if you're looking to get into the field or you're making a jump, put a comment on social media and work with us. And, you know, tell us about what's making you successful and how you can professionalize yourself. And, you know, share that within the community. Collaborate with us. And with that, we'll see you for the next one. Peace. Peace.